It's half past three and you're listening to Neighbourhood Watch on Shock Radio. Coming up in today's show, we have stories from students who have been the victim of theft, sexual and physical assault and the growing cybercrime. Stick around as well for the founder of the Old English Self-Defence Company, Scott Patterson, and his safety tips. Throughout the show, he gives us an insight into the best way to handle potentially dangerous situations. There's a lot of old wives' tales about what you can and can't do in a self-defence situation. However, it all boils down to good prevention, common sense, and keeping a cool head. I'd like to inform those who are easily offended or are otherwise very sensitive to hard-hitting topics to exercise extreme discretion whilst listening to today's show. The University of Salford offer a drop-in service from 10am till noon on weekdays at the University House for non-urgent cases. For urgent cases, telephone 0161 295 7008 to contact the advisors. To paint the picture, I live in what's described as a secure gated community. I got home from a long day at uni, went up into my flat to get my bike covering chains. I was casually strolling out my flat when I turned to where I'd left my bike and it wasn't there. The first thing I thought was I'm being stupid. I'm always misplacing things. Did I leave it under another bike shed maybe or just forgot about it? But then I, I reassured myself that it was there that I'd left it. It had been stolen. A whole summer of saving to afford that brand new motorbike had just been taken away from me. Also, losing that sense of security and feeling exposed to other people. I ran directly over to the office where the security guard sits. You know, one would have thought watching the CCTV for people stealing things from the premises. I was just in shock, couldn't get my words out. I said that my motorbike had been stolen and the security guard responded with, I know. I saw two people walking off the premises pushing a motorbike. The gate was broken and I hadn't been able to reset it yet. I didn't know how to respond to what he just said. I just stood there, not knowing whether to laugh or cry. Pulled out my phone as if things weren't bad enough, it was out of battery. So I asked the security guard to ring the police immediately. But I had no sense of urgency about him at all. After a lengthy conversation with the operator, she just reassured me that my registration had been circulated amongst the police cars just in case it's spotted. She said that it's just a waiting game now though, give it 24 hours, ring up your insurance, get that ball rolling. I returned to my flat and just locked myself in my room. It's not the fact that my bike had been stolen. I'm not that materialistic. It's just the fact that someone else thinks it's acceptable to take what isn't theirs and for what? A bit of cash and a quick buzz. I've been brought up knowing right from wrong and that people work hard for what's theirs and it's no one's right to take that away from them. So that was the story of about the theft of a motorcycle from a student at Salford University. Uh, Greater Manchester has one of the highest rates of uh, vehicle theft based on population uh, over the past five years alone. Salford is ranked third out of 59 neighbourhoods in Greater Manchester for vehicle crime with a staggering 18% per thousand people that have been affected. Greater Manchester is the third biggest city in England and holds a few of most popular universities, so it is unsurprising that there is a also a high crime rate especially affecting young students we have a story of james a student who fell victim to a vicious attack and a mugging on a night out i went out once recently but i didn't enjoy it because i just felt on edge the whole evening like i felt more paranoid than i've ever felt in my life Drunken assaults are extremely common amongst partygoers in Manchester. The increase in consumption of alcohol is linked closely to its affordability. Believe it or not, it is actually 50% more affordable than it was 20 years ago. Here is James's story. But first, it's time for one of Scott's top tips. Try to diffuse any situation instead of meeting violence with violence. Verbally trying to calm a situation down, reason with someone or solve the issue calmly instead of fighting fire with fire is the best course of action. Is getting your teeth knocked out over spilling someone's pint worth it? Apologise, buy him a fresh beer and move on. This is a story about the night out uh, in Manchester where I was basically with two mates. As the night uh, progressed, we were going to all these different clubs. I started to feel more ill throughout the night. Couldn't find my mates, so I just went off by myself. 
Um, I got told where the taxis were by security, so I went over and I actually ended up going in the wrong direction, so I couldn't find where any of the taxis were. Uh, I kept walking around corners, walked for a few minutes, and then actually I walked around another corner and bumped into a group of lads. And like one of them came up and asked me for money, said I didn't have any at all, but they then actually followed me instead of uh, just leaving me alone. So they kept asking, kept asking, and I kept throwing them off. But it got to the point where one actually threw a punch to my head, um, which dazed me. They then like further kicked me to the floor and kept kicking me when I was down. Got to the point where they actually knocked me out. And so I woke up in the back of an ambulance. I uh, can't remember anything at all. Just woke up with a broken jaw, like swollen eye sockets as well, like two fractured ribs, just like generally aching all over. And as a result of that, I actually ended up being in hospital for three days, missed work, and missed uni, affected my deadlines quite badly, and it affected my social life. In the UK during 2013 and 2014, statistics shown that 64% of all recorded incidents of drunken assaults took place between strangers, whereas acquaintances came in at 52%. Violent incidents like these are more likely to occur during weekends and holidays when full days of drinking are involved. Always let someone know where you are and who you are with, especially if your plans change. I know I sound like your dad, but it isn't just for children. It's for us adults too. Even professionals such as police officers, armed forces and security staff regularly keep someone informed. Be your own bodyguard. It takes just one quick call, a text or a little message. With the state of current affairs, racially motivated attacks are becoming more common. It is very difficult to actually get reliable statistics regarding racially motivated attacks in the UK. However, according to the UK Home Office, hate crimes have increased by 18%, and that's not including the crimes that haven't already been reported to the police. Police recorded 52,528 hate crimes in the 2014 year, up to 44,471 in 2013, with more than 80% of these recorded been racially motivated. A horrific act of terror took place on the 6th of December, which is, as you can probably imagine, quite recent, when a man brandishing a machete slashed three people at the Laystone Tube Station. Members of the public looked on in shock as victim hero David Pethers attempted to disarm the assailant. Recent reports suggest the assailant may have had mental health problems, therefore it is unsure for the reason for such a horrendous crime. The attack began at 7pm as he screamed, This is for Syria. From one of the videos captured amongst the noise, a young Londoner named Mubir Hussein summed up what thousands of Muslims have been trying to say to terrorists who say they're acting in the name of Islam. You ain't no Muslim, bro. You're no Muslim, bruv. You ain't no Muslim. The saying, you ain't no Muslim, bruv, turned into a hashtag and quickly went viral. Various people took to Twitter to voice their opinions. I Akul wrote, I'm a Muslim and my mum gets mad at me if I harm a spider. Islam teaches people peace. Hashtag, you ain't a Muslim, bruv. Wasay Ashra also said, you ain't no Muslim, bruv. If you are a terrorist, you aren't a Muslim, a Christian, a Hindu, or even a Buddhist. No religion promotes violence. Even Boris Johnson joined the trend, saying, I am a proud, I am so proud that so many Londoners are uniting behind the hashtag you aren't no Muslim bruv. We will be not be divided. Although there is no proof this was really a terrorist attack, the Metropolitan Counter Terrorist Terrorism Command urged the public to remain calm but alert and vigilant. The time is now at 3.39 and it's also time for Scott's top tips. Think of your self-defence as self-protection. Being aware of what's happening around you, using your common sense like not taking a shortcut through the local rape hotspot on the way home at night because it's five minutes quicker. Prevention is better than cure. You can report anything that makes you feel uncomfortable. Report it to stop it. Sexual assaults are becoming increasingly common in the Salford area. In 2014, 19 women were sexually assaulted and two men reported as being sexually assaulted. However, the majority of sexual assault cases are still not reported. 
one in five women will be sexually assaulted whilst at college, while only 4% of men will be sexually assaulted. It is estimated that 5% of sexual assaults on college campuses are reported, making sexual assault the most underreported crime. Next comes the story of a 21 year old girl who fell victim to a sexual assault. So, it was a Wednesday at 4 pm when I decided that I was going to meet up with my mates. It was 20 minutes from my house. Never walked there before, but um, I had Google Maps. I got there fine. I hung out with my mates, had a good time, and then I decided about 9.30ish that I was going to start heading home. I'd forgotten about the cross over the road, and this is, like, sadly to say, quite typical of my sense of direction. Something the area that I was in didn't look like the rest of the area. I was trying to call a taxi service that I knew. I couldn't find a road name, but it was getting pretty dark and I think it got quite a lot later. And I had four cars, um, taxis, so I tried to wave them down, but three of them passed and I was looking at my phone and a car did a U-turn and stopped next to me and said, where are you going? And I said, oh, I'm, I'm just going to um, my house address. And he said, yeah, of course, I can take you there. Get in. So I got in and I sat in the front because I always do for uh, taxi drivers. And I said, most people don't get my address right. Let me put on um, my directions to my house. And uh, it kept uh, saying we were going the wrong way. I didn't really think too much of it. Next thing I know, he's got his hand on my lap. And I was a bit taken aback and I said, I'm not okay with that. And that was the first time I messaged my boyfriend, please. That was at 10.53. He was obviously uncomfortable with me messaging people. And he said, what are you doing? And I said, um, my friends had just messaged me to say that they'd got home okay. He seemed to be a little bit more comfortable with me by that point, so he put his hand on my lap again. And then I felt the car going faster, so I started looking outside, and, um, I mean, I haven't got the best sense of direction in the world, but I saw a sign. It was really far, it's probably like 30, 40 minute drive. This is when I started to panic more. I tried to call my boyfriend who I live with. He wasn't answering because he wasn't in. The car pulled up in a field. This is when he uh, sexually assaulted me. I tried to open the door. We pressed the lock just before and he said something like, I thought you'd like it. My friends do it all the time. And I said, please stop. But then he started driving off really quickly. He was kissing my cheek and saying, like, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to upset you. So at 11.30, I wrote, help me, please. I'm so scared. He saw me messaging and he said, put your phone in the middle of the car. Anyway, he let me keep my phone, but he had half an eye on whatever I was typing. I looked out the window and I saw that we were coming up to where I lived, but he had no intention of stopping because he just kept driving. Genuinely, I thought I was gonna die. And I thought, I've gotta do it now. With two yanks of the um, door handle, I flung open the door and I jumped out, fractured my leg and sprained my arm. No one stopped. I pulled myself to my feet and dragged myself as fast as I could to my house, which was probably like five minutes up the road. Probably about one minute from my house, my boyfriend finally found me. He'd been walking up and down the road. Next thing I know, the police and ambulance were at my house. I was taken for x-rays and whatnot. And then they took me into a little cubicle where the police questioned me. He was a really nice guy, a really nice guy, um, and everyone was 
really worried about me. They asked me what happened, I told them the whole story, and then I didn't really think loads about it at the time. He said, I hate having to ask this, but it's one of the standard court questions. When you sit down, does your dress ride up? I think I felt a bit like I was to blame for everything for months. I couldn't really properly leave my house. I was scared to tell my mum. I spent a lot of time drinking and smoking and crying. I was alone a lot of the time. I was speaking to one of my sisters. She said to me, I had the exact same thing happen to me when I was at uni. And what really got to me was that she hadn't really told anyone either. And what I realised was even speaking to the police, speaking to people I know, my friends, my family, this happens all the time. And that's pretty scary. Quite a hard to hear interview there. Um, well, today's figures show that a 20% annual increase in recorded rapes and a 17% rise in sexual offences have been reported to the police in England and Wales. The number of reported rapes and sexual offences in England and Wales has reached its highest level since 2002 to 2003, the ONS says. Although the increase is worrying, it also shows that victims are more willing to come forward and report their crimes as opposed to years gone by. Don't forget, any unwanted contact is assault and if it makes you feel uncomfortable, report it. Now I think it's time for another one of Scott's top tips. Remain aware of your surroundings. If you feel uneasy in a situation, don't put yourself in a bubble. The common reaction is to put your headphones in on a personal stereo, bury your head in a book, or pull your hood over your head. Or all three sometimes. For good self-protection, you need to be aware of as much as going on as possible. Don't blinker yourself. In this section of the show, we are talking about cybercrime. The crime for England and Wales has doubled to more than 11.6 million offences, according to the latest figure. The sharp rise in headline figures is due to the inclusion of an estimated 5.1 million online fraud incidents and 2.5 million cybercrime offences for the first time. The first incident of instant incident of cybercrime started in 1971, but due to its escalation in the mid to late noughties, the first draft of cyber law was created in 2002 and was passed in 2012. Since the invention of the internet, crime has risen hugely, varying from assault to fraud. The youths of today have grown up with the internet and it has become part of their everyday life. Because of this, children are comfortable with doing things online that they wouldn't normally do in real life. First, we have an interview with two youth workers who have to deal with cyberbullying and the effects it has on people. I, th- I think, really, we get a lot of kind of <coughs> anecdotes from young people about things that have been said online, conversations that have been had online, comments that have been made that, you know, if they were in the yard together at school, they would never say that to somebody's mm-hmm. face. But I think it's because there's like a bit of an an anonymity behind being online. People feel that they can maybe say things and there aren't the same kind of consequences as if you are face to face with people. What would you say would be the most severe comment that has been said thus far that a young person's come and said to you? I think we've had, the ones that I'm aware of, we've had young people who have been like in relationships with people or it's been, maybe not been in a relationship, but there's been like something has happened between a boy and a girl. Or, and that's kind of maybe gone a little bit sour and or friends have got involved or it's it's become a little bit ugly quite quickly um, and comments can be quite personal and obviously quite cutting sometimes and just things that are you know there then and everybody's seen them and it's the embarrassment of that that goes with it. So what is it about cyberbullying that seems to affect young people so severely especially in the nowadays world? Cyberbullying it's a quite an easy way to bully 
because it's quite faceless as well so you can bully somebody and you don't have to actually physically face them so you can bully people that you don't even know or perhaps are miles away or perhaps you want to say something towards them but you haven't got that confidence to do it in real life if you know what i mean but you can do it on uh, social media and things like that and probably get away with more i mean my advice would always be to a young person that they are responsible for what they put out there online um, they're always responsible for their own comments and their own kind of actions online as you are every day but that if they can block people if they can avoid being part of those networks I think I think the fact is that it never seems to stop so people young people have to take responsibility for their own self really sometimes if they they put that out themselves and they may not think it's bullying, but it is bullying. How do you prevent cyberbullying? Is there any kind of tips or any kind of advice you could give a young person? I think it's very difficult to stop other people from cyberbullying, yeah. If there's other people out there who's intent on doing it, uh, the, the, it's very difficult to stop that. And it perhaps it might be not the things you say, it might be the things you don't say or don't do or are not part of that encourages other people. But I suppose it's just to be safe with your own sort of, don't be giving out your own phone numbers, your own email. Young people have this tendency, and old people as well, but they have this tendency to want as many people to be their friends on Facebook as humanly possible. That they haven't got a clue who they are, they don't know who they are at all, and so that's a massive issue. I think one thing that always I think works well in our work is if young people challenge that kind of behaviour themselves. So if a young person saw that kind of activity online and challenged it themselves and said, you know, that kind of comment is really unnecessary or it's just out of order to say that or what impact do you think that's having on somebody saying that? I think it has a lot more weight when it comes from a peer sometimes than when it does coming from like an authority figure like a teacher or a youth worker or a parent. So I'd, I'd always encourage young people to challenge that kind of behaviour themselves online. Very informative interview there from Richard Fawcett and Claire Smith from the Young People Service. The interview there provided an insight into some of their daily duties as youth workers and counsellors and also provides that Richard and Claire are valuable people to the necessary resources that are available to the youth of today. Our next interview is with a young girl who has been bullied over the internet and she discusses how this has affected her at home. So what do you think of cyberbullying? I think it's very easy for people to cyberbully these days um, just because a lot of people have Facebook and other social networking sites like Twitter, even YouTube comments like it's really easy to pick on somebody from any website. You don't have to know the person to cyber bully them, if that makes sense. So it's easy. Like, you don't have to go up to the person, like in the old days, and start picking on them. Now you can just start picking on them without being face to face with them. So it's a lot easier for a lot of people, and it's quite cowardly in a way. Obviously, bullying as a topic on a whole isn't fair, but you know, it's, it's so much easier to cyber bully with that being the case. So, how did you deal with? being bullied. One of my first methods I did was actually approach um, the people who were bullying me and say, you know, would you just stop? Like, just leave me alone, just drop it, you know, all that stuff. And um, that didn't work. So then I tried to be regrettably more like them and say, you know, and bully them back in a way. But it didn't really work as well because I felt first of all that I was lowering myself to their level so that made me uncomfortable and second of all it made the bullying worse because I retaliated so yeah um, but then I went ahead and told I told my parents and um, there was a big bust up between my parents and their parents it was awful it, it made my school life I guess like really difficult it affected me in a really bad way um I found that I would wake up in the morning and I'd think I don't want to go to school today and then you know I would pretend to be sick and I would say to my parents like you know I can't go in I've got you know a bug or something and then at first they believed me because it would just it was just the first few times and then after that they would start saying you know no, you're not sick you know you're fine and you've been sick too often so you have to go in yeah and i was encouraged to talk about my feelings but i felt just so alone it was awful 72 percent of teenagers and young adults believe that digital abuse is something that should be addressed by society cyberbullying is common in children and since the creation of chat rooms young people have been victims of unwanted sexual contact it has made the offense of sexual assault easier and harder to detect. Coming up next, our colleague Talia spoke to a young girl who would use the internet to meet older men online. People also can be naive to situations which they find themselves in when it comes to meeting strangers online. 
Have you ever met anyone offline? Yeah, multiple times. How old were you? 14 or 15, like when I started. And what were you using to meet these people? Twitter and like, you know, Tinder, the app, I'm using that. Did you lie about your age? I started off lying about my age, yeah, I was 18. How old were the guys that you were meeting? 18 to like 25. Did they ever find out how old you actually were? No, I never told them my age. It was normally um, going back to their house, doing stuff with them. Why did you do it? What did you get out of it? I just didn't really like boys my age. I prefer older boys. I just feel like they're more mature. I went for them over people my age. Do loads of your friends do it? Is it quite a common thing? Yeah, it is actually quite a common thing to go out with older boys. Are you not scared that you're going to get them in trouble? It would, it would really fall back on them because I lied about my age and I did consent to doing stuff with them. I would never put them in that position where they would be the one in trouble because it's my fault. And the first time that I ever met up with someone, I was really scared because he was obviously a lot older. Before meeting up, we did have sexual conversations. I think it was just this, I was scared because it was the first time. I'm not really scared they were older. It was more like this situation that I was put myself in. It did cross my mind that something might happen, but he wanted to do something that I didn't want to do. Did that never happen? The more I like met up with people, the more they started to ask off. But I didn't, I wasn't really comfortable doing, but I kind of put myself in a situation where I could really say no, because I was like at their house. Yeah, I was comfortable with like doing like, oral and stuff, but then when it actually got to do more, that's when I started feeling uncomfortable. How many guys roughly have you met up with off Tinder or Twitter? We have over the age of 18, five or six. Did you ever tell anyone about your age? I told one person my age because I actually started to like them as a person so I didn't really want to keep it from them. They were found that I was like 15 at the time. How old was he? I think about 19. Do you think you'll do it again? I don't meet up with people from the internet. It's like less of a secret now since I'm 16 and it's actually legal. One in 25 youths received an online sexual solicitation in which the solicitor tried to make an offline contact. The worrying thing is that the internet is so new and is adapting so quickly that it is hard to monitor and stop these crimes. The real question, however, for crime in general, is what is the likelihood of criminals reoffending? Our colleague Talia contacted a prison officer to get her opinion on this. There is more people in prisons with sex offending crimes. They talk about expanding, certainly the prison where I work, to accommodate sex offenders. And I know that there has been a prison down south that has changed from kind of your normal offenders to just purely sex offenders. So I don't know really whether it's that more is being reported or the prevalence is just increased of, of sex offenders. What's the most likely crime to be reoffended? Things like shoplifting, people trying to get by, maybe no fixed abode, little education, bit of a revolving door really in my experience. What's the average age of offenders? I mean obviously that can vary from having young offenders that have probably been in prison since the age of kind of 12 up until the older generation of maybe people that have only had their crimes recently brought to the forefront and then received a sentence. I'd say it maybe in 20s, 30s, probably around that age. I think probably you know the thing about crime is a far wider problem than people just going out committing crime for the sake of it. It's much more of a social issue. People that may come from broken families and haven't had the guidance and support from their parents that other privileged people may have had. Little education, maybe people not even attending school. So leaving school with few qualifications, a lot not being able to read and write, go into crime as a matter of trying to get by and then comes with that drugs, debt, then more crime, having nowhere to live, quite often no family support. That can of continues really so they can be released from prison with no fixed abode and I would say certainly a lot of people would re-offend just purely so that they could come back to prison and have some quality of life, a roof over the head, warmth, food, health care and certainly in my experience I know that people do commit crimes just so that they can get back into prison because they may not have nothing on the outside. Very very sad really, a very sad fact of society that we can't facilitate people. So after that interview it's hard to say what the answer is to preventing such crimes. You can't stop the actions of others but you can do your best to stay vigilant and try not to put yourself in situations where you may feel at risk. We hope you found the information provided in today's show useful. 
we have been Neighbourhood Watch, and if you have been affected at all by any of the stories we have broadcast, please contact the Ask Us service on 0161 295 7008. It is important that your voice is heard. Don't suffer in silence.